it and you realize how small the internet was back then yeah big big money but it's much easier to get client money these days find it i don't think they worried if we were hacking as long as it worked and mm. you could name a lot of those early pioneers as people that built the infrastructure that everything we've got today was based on mm. Today, I'm talking to Amon Johns. Amon has been in the industry since the very early days. And over the last 25 years, he's been incredibly generous with his time, contributing to forums and social media, and also mentoring a great deal many people to get started in the industry. I hope you enjoy this incredibly interesting conversation with a lot of insights into the early days of SEO. So Amon, welcome. Hello. And I'm going to jump straight in. And the first question I'm going to ask you is to get kicked off is I'd really be great if you could give me a um, sort of a timeline from when you started in the industry. In the early years, there was no industry. SEO not only didn't have a name and a label, but we didn't have a cohesive uh, sense of doing the same thing. There were a lot of people who were driving traffic to websites in various ways. And quite a lot of those included using the web directories and search engines. And it wasn't until 2007, so a couple of years in, before the term SEO was coined. And it wasn't really until 2008 that I would call it an industry. That was when we really started to have an idea that we were in this together and doing the same thing. So, so just jumping back, when was the very first time that you actually started operating online? Uh, in an in a online marketing capacity? I started in 95 with designing websites, building websites that had developed from building for friends, then building for friends of friends, and then building for the kind of friends of friends who have to give you a bottle of scotch or pay you something. <laughs> and then that had become a business building websites. And they were, we loved the site. The customers we got seemed to love the site, but we heard there were millions of people. Where are they? And I honestly said, I don't know, but um, I'll do some digging around, see what I can find out. If I find anything that looks promising, I will charge you for the time it takes to implement it and, you know, test it out and, and perfect it. Uh, and about six months later, I was starting to get leads from those clients to their business associates and others they knew who were coming in and saying, can you do that traffic thing? Do we have to have a new website? So this was 95, isn't this right? So 95, going into yeah. 96. Yeah. During 96, I transitioned from doing web design to mostly doing promotion. And by 97, I had shut down all web design and was only doing promotion. And you were just working for yourself doing this? Yeah. yeah. So where did you go from, from 97 to 2000s? Um, so you so like you start you joined Creative Site in two thousand two is that right? Yeah. So just coming back from that, can you remember sort of ninety seven up to how you came to join Creative Site? Sure. Um, ninety seven. I've. I'm pretty sure the news group uh, SEO was going, which was I search discussion list. Um. That was Sorry. run by Detlev. Danny Sullivan was involved. Search Engine Watch existed as a site around that time. What year do you think was it Search Engine Watch? This was around 97. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure that that was there then. iSearch was certainly going. And that was an email group. Um, you got a refresher each day of, of kind of the big discussions that were going on 
um, and you could join in with that. And that was this that was the central meeting point of the industry because that was the thing that was dedicated to SEO. Creator site. What year was that actually started, established? Uh, two thousand and two, second half of that year. Is it Kim? Was it Kim Krausberg? Kim Krausberg. Yeah. And I'd known her from previous forum interactions in the late nineties. I'd been a part of the market position talk forums, which were run by uh, the software company that produced Web Position Gold. That was a tool back in the day that used uh, keyword density, keyword prominence, keyword count, those kind of on-page metrics. Before Google, most people ignored links completely. The only person who talked about links really was Eric Ward, and he oh. was doing it for traffic. So when, was, when did Eric come into the industry? He was certainly there again around 97. In the really early days. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's another first gen. And what I always liked was his focus. Like mine, we were, we were web promoters. Yeah. We didn't narrow it to just SEO. There was no SEO when we started. We were looking at all the things that brought traffic, that drove sales, that, that built reputations. Mm. It's interesting that both of you, as you say there, that you both like approached it um, as web promotion, that uh, your mentality and your approach does tend to be much more holistic and much more of a marketing perspective. And so it's quite interesting that that's probably what brings, that that's probably where your, what I would call an abstract way of thinking um, probably comes from. Whereas most people think today are just very much focused on SEO, you know, manipulating search engine, manipulating Google, whereas, you know, really the whole holistic marketing view. We, we don't forget the big picture and a lot of SEOs get tied into this immediate chain. I need my site to rank, so I need links, so I need to buy links. Mm -hmm. You've missed all of the strategy there of, okay, I need to get more customers. Will reaching more people do that better than selling more to the people I'm already meeting? Mm, mm. You know, should I be working on uh, conversion relations, uh, conversion ratios instead? Mm, mm. Should I be changing who I'm bringing instead of just trying to, just trying to bring more of the same? Yeah, or when I actually get people to the site, what are they going to do? Am I offering is my value proposition strong enough to actually deliver to the traffic that I'm bringing to the site? Yeah. Um, anyway, so we are, we are digressing. If we just, if I just pull you back, you did it there. I know, I know. So lead me up to um, the early, so the turn of the millennium and leading up to a creative site, how you came to be involved. Okay. So there was, they was trying to compete in the search engines. And even then, there were a lot of anti-spam measures. Um, spam was a lot more obvious in the main because search engines were very bad at analyzing text. They were just keyword matching. They were looking for a string in text. They were starting to use various methods that equate to phrase-based matching, but it, it, it was nowhere compared to today. Um, so actually, I, I know we're getting ahead here, but this we've raised it and this is a really interesting point. Search engines were quite immature as to what they are now, right? They were quite simple. It was just a case of a phrase. It wasn't even query. It was just word matching, right? They couldn't always associate the plural with the single. They had to have special programs to do stemming to determine that this was essentially the same word. And there were flaws in that. Um, synonyms were completely different words. You know, you had to optimize for the exact word you wanted to rank for. The search engines of that time did not understand that all of these various things 
went together. And if you were talking about tea, then it was probably also relevant for teas, cups of tea, pot of tea, loose leaf tea. You know, you would have to optimize mm. a page for each of those phrases or mm. include all of those phrases in the pages you wanted to rank. There was mm. no synonyms. So I think we'll come back to this in a minute, but just to go back to create a site. Okay, so through the market position talk, these are people who build doorway pages. Doorway pages was the technique of that day. Um, you built a page that was specifically designed to rank in a specific engine. And that had been going since the InfoSeek days. InfoSeek was brilliant. It had instant indexing. You submitted and your page was in the results, which how meant- did, How did they achieve that? Because it was a very small index. Um, literally, you know, you, the, you submitted and it went up. There were, there were only a few million pages, really. That they, you know what the growth rate is like. Play that in reverse, that exponential growth, and you realise how small the internet was back then. Yeah. You probably only had 10 online competitors in the world unless you were in travel, adult, dating, loans, casinos, uh, you know, specifically poker and uh, pharma. How, how, many, um, how many SEOs do you think there were back in the early days? Even then, there were hundreds dabbling. There were probably 50 people that most people who looked for tips, looked for share, uh, shares, looked for articles, knew. You know, mm -hmm. there, there were 50 authors. Mm. Um, so a few hundred, but you, you can't really say how many were in the trenches and keeping their heads down. So who were they, some of the first names? that Because you, you mentioned Eric. Did you, were you in contact with Eric in the early days? We knew of each other. We hadn't, I think we traded a few comments here and there, but, you know, we hadn't phoned up and chatted or, or you know, talked to each other on instant messengers that didn't exist. One of my, sorry, just jumping with a, a random little story, but my favourite link that I ever built was actually on the homepage of Eric Ward's nice. website. Eric gave me a link from his homepage. I don't think that was one of my uh, favorite link scores that I ever achieved. Sorry, anyway, to digress. No, but, um, um, honestly, that's one of the best ways to value links. You know, when we will talk about metrics probably later, but when you're looking at link metrics, the ultimate metric that I tell everyone to use is, is this a link you would ring your mum up and go, mum, I got a link from... Yeah. You can't tell your mum and explain why this is valuable. It probably isn't. Mm. Yeah. Um, so apart from Eric's name, so who else in those early days, who was the first other SEO that you met? Um, Danny and Detlev through the I search list mm -hmm. along with um, Adam or Det. Um, John O'Dare, uh, Christine Churchill, who else was around? Uh, <laughs> pretty much all of the early pioneers. We we talked a little bit earlier, and I know you'll be you'll be talking to some of these people, but mm -hmm. yeah, there there were only there were only fifty people really talking about this stuff. So you were. You knew the names. But where was the main point of contact that you were? The iSearch discussion list in the really, really early days. Yeah, so then discussion the forums right. started up. But the forums were usually started by a software manufacturer or by someone who was selling something. It, it was a support community for mm. something rather yeah. than, you know, SEO for yeah. SEO. So a lot of people uh, in and around the industry, you'd meet them in various forums. The biggest one around that time was um, high traffic form might have been Jim Wald. Certainly SEF was the big one, search engine forums. That was the first dedicated SEO forum. 
What year do you think that was? 97, 98. Okay. Um, certainly 99, it was the biggie, biggie. Um, and that's where I met people like Mike Mackin, Darren Babin. Um, maybe that's where I first encountered Extreme PFR, who then went on to work for Google years later. Um, so you, there were a lot of people you bumped into or rubbed, sure. or rubbed shoulders with. Um, how long were you with Creator Site for? Two years? Five. Oh, you were as, five. as an admin. Yeah. Right. Okay. And what people who did you meet? Uh, is it Bill Slaus? Who was he? Was one of the other admins? Kim was the. So other she was active, house, but I mean, what I meant is, was she actually active on it? Yes. And her focus, of course, was mostly usability. She'd done SEO. Yeah. But her passion was UX. Yeah. So we always took a more holistic view of a website than just ranking. It needed to perform for users. It needed to be giving a good experience. It needed to perform business-wise or achieve the objective that you'd created the website for. Mm -hmm. We had a forum specifically on the tricky aspects of measuring. One of the forum members was the creator of ClickTracks, which was an analytics overlay. You could look at your site and it put the stats next to it. So you could look at a page and it would put the percentage of clicks that were going to each link from that page. And it was really good for a cognitive walkthrough of a site with the stats overlaid so you could see why this is getting clicked and that isn't. That's really interesting. I'm actually thinking, when did um, when did Google Analytics start? Oh, uh, a little while later, they bought Urchin. Urchin was a great program. I've always thought that Google Analytics was one of the worst things to happen to the community because it, it literally killed dead most other analytics programs. Who was going to use something else once Google had done it? Mm. Mm. A friend of mine, Michael Martinez, um, He's been saying there's been a, a poll on Twitter. Should Google create an SEO glossary? If Google dictate the terms of what is and isn't SEO and how it's defined, it will rule out anything they don't want. You won't even have the language to discuss the stuff they don't want. That, that's really interesting, actually, because uh, I know in the early days, obviously, SEOs came first. Then Google was established. Google was actually talking to the SEOs to get them on board. And then after that, Google then flipped the switch and started dictating. Whereas in the beginning, actually the SEOs were the ones that had the authority over Google. So what year did what, what year, go, year was it that Google was introduced? Well, they first opened up in 98. 98 they didn't right. attain dominance. They didn't become the dominant engine until late 2001. Okay. It took them a few years to, to catch up because Google were doing no advertising. They had no marketing yeah. budget. So Whereas before Yahoo were on TV, Microsoft were on TV, Jeeves was advertising on TV. Yeah, yeah. Even Lycos with its little black Labrador. Not original. I mean, they were the. Who were the original teams. ones? Archie. Right. Uh, and I mean, that really was basic. Okay. Then you had things like Northern Light, Web Wombat. I think Search PC was around that time as well. Search PC gave us a meta tag that lurked around for years, which was the revisit after meta tag. And for years, SEOs were putting this nonsense tag in their page that no <laughs> other search engine had ever used, and Search at BC had abandoned the year after they introduced it. A classic case of people copying for the sake of copying yes. without... Also the problem with correlation studies. Because if you looked at what pages were ranking, 90% of them had this tag. Thing is, the pages that are ranking are most likely the ones that are being done by people who are either SEOs or with an interest in SEO, which means they are the ones most likely to be using this tag it's coincidence, not really correlation.
So Google, when Google first came in, do you remember what, what was it that kind of drew you into starting using Google? We started seeing this little robot in our logs back rub. Because mm -hmm. uh, Googlebot was originally back rub. Yeah. And a few of us who paid attention to robots, mostly because either we knew of hacking or we knew of cloaking and we kept an eye on, on IPs and robots that were about. Mm -hmm. um, so the people who were interested in that started noticing this spider, looked up what it was, found out it was an interesting project uh, and were some of the first to test Google. As I say, Google had no marketing budget. It grew by word of mouth. Mm. And most of that word of mouth came from those early SEOs and webmasters looking to see what this bot was on their site. Mm. Uh, their tie into Yahoo, of course, got them a huge amount of uh, exposure. They were the search provider, the organic search provider on yahoo.com. Right. And they weren't the first to, to do that. They, Yahoo had used other people before. Uh, if I remember rightly, the very first contract to provide that, Yahoo got a 10% share of Google. And when it was extended, they got another 10% share of Google. And pretty much the only thing that's kept Yahoo going all these years is the fact that they own 20% of Google. So do you, do you actually remember back to the early days of when Google used to invite SEOs to their headquarters and started to kind of establish a relationship with SEOs? Yeah, they were doing that mid-noughties. Um, okay. And the, the, I mean, the, the classic first one of those we remember, they did the Google dance and they had some, you know, little social meets and they'd been doing the meet the crawler sessions at search engine strategies and, you know, mixing with the, the attendance uh, uh, conferences. But the one that really stood out was when they brought people back to their HQ for the Google dance. And Dave Naylor was introduced to one of the Google founders, got to spend some time in a, lo uh, uh, in a room alone with him with a keyboard. And David had shared a few things that were broken about Google over the years. And they, they found him interesting. He, of course, found them interesting. And, and that was the, the basis of it. Honestly, SEOs were the first to appreciate what Google was doing. I think SEOs probably helped to inform Sergey and Larry quite a lot of how to develop and involve Google. I mean, do you think that they could have even achieved the uptake? Because really, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship, isn't it? Google needs SEOs, SEOs need Google. No. Um, no? Oh, A lot of the explain. early hires at Google came from AltaVista. AltaVista... Right. They regarded SEOs the same kind of way that a mother bear regards a hunter picking up her cubs. You know, they have built something and here's these people trying to despoil it, ruin it, crap all over it and break it. Um, no, that, that, it was a very adversarial relationship. And a lot of people in the academic information retrieval space see all of us as Luddites. Uh, so actually, just to quickly interject, was it, was it Larry or Sergey that actually famously quoted that it was impossible to spam Google? They really thought it was unbeatable and then obviously, so was it, do you think it was that quite a shock? That always maintained to a, a level, they say, you know, page rank because of the way it works. It's impossible to spam there. But of course, Google bombing always said otherwise. Google, do you think Larry and Sergey, when they developed the, the, the original algorithm, obviously they're working at Stanford and then they launched their search engine into the, into the world. Do you think they actually, do you think they had envisaged that people would be able to manipulate? Do you think they'd actually even realized 
that it would just become this target for manipulation? Or do you think they naively thought that people would just, you know, use it in a, a really nice, lovely way? And I would certainly have been informed very early on that search has adversaries, that, that people want to spam those permission positions. As I say, um, Alta Vista was killed by spam. Right. The spammers killed that engine. Uh, all of the engines dealt with spam. It was felt that page rank was such a huge signal. You know, the link graph, the whole yeah. internet. Yeah. How can you pervert that? It's it's it was certainly more resistant. But SEOs are, are very creative. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> stubborn. I think they're some of the most creative people there are black hats. I think it just is just staggering. Their creativity of manipulation is just unbelievable. I think it's one of the reasons why I love the industry so much. There's a um, lot of black hat that is ugly and stupid, just like, you know, there's a lot of scammers who are like those Indian call centers where how this fools anyone, you really do wonder. But there's some brilliant, brilliant con men out there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. I think there's enough of a challenge to it that it draws curious minds. And curious minds are always um, to be to be worried about. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So in those early days of Google, um, what was what do you think what was what was working back then to get ranking? For the very early years of Google, when Google was still the minority, everyone was focused on the big ones, Inc. Tomy, Yahoo, AOL, um, AltaVista, of course, and doorway pages worked great. This, could this you, sorry, could you just text. give me a little bit more of an explanation of a doorway page, please? Okay, there were differences even then. Some people only use them where the doorway wasn't visible and it instantly redirected you to the main page. So you, uh, there might be 15 doorway pages that all delivered you to one place, but it was a different page that was ranking. Sometimes that was done visibly through a very fast redirect, sometimes through a JavaScript redirect because search engines back then didn't do anything with JavaScript, didn't know it existed and some used cloaking. So the search engine's got one version of a page and the user saw a completely different. So you didn't need a redirect for that. The URL that the engine was, was the page that a search engine saw at that URL was different to the page that a user saw at that URL. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted a page to rank by just repeated keyword, 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 keywords, 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 keywording, keywording, keyword. You could do that. Key separate word. Yeah. <laughs> so you could have a page of, of gibberish. Yeah. And because no people would see it, only the engines. Yeah. It might perform quite well. Do you think that was quite wide, wide, widely spread that a lot of, that's what a lot of people were doing to rank? It was expensive. The risks of getting caught were a complete ban. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't the majority of people were doing cloaking. It, it was too expensive for the majority of people. Why was it expensive? Because you had to have a huge number of sites keeping up with all of the robots. Uh, you had to look for those new IP addresses constantly. And there's always that first couple of hundred people who get hit before you've seen the pattern of this bot turns up and pages disappear. You know, you've, you've got one user amongst all these users who isn't really a user. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd use what you'd call bot traps. And this was a way of hiding links from people that would show to spiders and, and programs 
the spider would click it and by going to that page you knew it was a bot how in those early days what um were Google doing any manual evaluation? I mean, how, how could you get banned? How could you, how would they detect manipulation? Most search engines had a combination of a few auto ban things, the things that would automatically exclude you. Um, Give me an example of one of them. Okay. Let's go for one of the exclusions first. Alta Vista. If you had a robots tag, uh, tag you were excluded. And it was a really weird one, but it made sense. This was towards the end of Alta Vista. But the only valid reason for having a robots exclusion protocol robots tag is to exclude the robot. It will index and it will follow by default. They don't want to follow if they're not indexing. Mm -hmm. If it's not in the index, why the hell would they care about what it yeah. links to? Yeah, it's a waste of their resources, right? Right. So if it had a robots tag at all, even if that said index follow, it was excluded. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't tell you it was excluded. You'd submit your page and it would say, thank you very much, but it would never show up. Mm. So were they doing any level of manual uh, review? Definitely. Um, that's trickier to specifically point out, but there, there were things where you knew it was happening. There were, there were times where you reported things yourself. Um, I worked in the dating arena and that was super competitive. So many affiliates. So even though I was working for one of the, the bigger dating companies of that time and a competitor of Match, we weren't just competing with Match. We were competing with a thousand Match affiliates. Yeah. And that all meant that there was a huge amount of competition. It was the days where only what was on your page mattered. So if you've got a, a good ranking page, somebody would literally copy and paste your page, swap your brand names for theirs, swap that final link that is a sign up to their sign up, mm. and, and submit that page. Snatch the from right under your nose. And often that would automatically grab the place under yours. Sometimes it would grab the place above, you know, because it was essentially the same kind of, of ranking signals that were coming from it, because it was the same page. When there was only on-page signals, yeah, you could just copy a page and you've got all of the signals. See, it's interesting because, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, in the industry, as we all know, we, we are a very, um, uh, sharing industry we share a lot of our knowledge between each other but also I, see, I still think there's a level of there's a surface level of sharing where we widely share surface stuff but I still think there's a lot that people hold but you know they hold back they're not really giving away the really good stuff and also a lot of people there's you know online oh well I can't tell you who it is or I can't tell you you know what I'm doing there's this there is actually quite um we appear on the outside to be very altruistic, but actually with this, uh, that we are covering up a lot of secrecy. Um, and I know, you know, that there's obviously really good reasons for this because, uh, you know, if we were to talk about the things that were really working, then, you know, Google is just going to jump in. They're going to pick that up and then they're going to close the loophole. Or more importantly, well, not necessarily more importantly, as importantly, we don't want our competitors to um, know what we're doing. So they're going to pick it apart. But you know what, we're 20 years, 20 years distance now with it. Can you tell me, because uh, I know you worked in, as you say, you worked in day, dating and you worked in adult industry as right? Is that right? Can you tell me um, any of those secrets that you wouldn't have shared back then? You know, is it 20 years have passed now? Can you give us some little inside gems? I mean, you don't need to name names, but something you've never shared before? I can see a glint in your eyes. That yeah. you, I know I can see it there. <laughs> there were a lot of tricks that worked. Um, there was uh, a time where early trick on Google, if you embedded an image 
it still counted that as a link. And you could pass page rank through images for a while. Um, it, it was a very strange little bug, and I assume it was a bug because it shouldn't really work that way, but it, it did. Um, I would sometimes embed small transparent GIFs with alt text in them. And that, that could do very well. And you, you would use it as a spacer anyway. Um, menus. Back then, you know, a, a screen width was six foot. You were dealing with 480 by 640 pixel screen, if you were lucky. There were still 320 screens around. <laughs> so you, you didn't have a lot of space on a menu. One word, two words, maybe. And they better be short words if, there, if there's more than two. Um, you'd get away with art of war. You wouldn't get away with the, almost any other three word <laughs> phrase without it line wrapping. Yeah. So what I would do is I'd often have one word that was kind of descriptive, but I would have a little icon gif, you know, maybe it was a little arrow, maybe it was a dot, something to mark the list items. Yeah. And that would have alt text and the anchor tag for the, the menu item would go around both the image and the text. And that got that alt text associated with the link. And that worked pretty well. But I regard that as almost a usability hack. I'm, getting around a limitation in the interface uh, to provide more use to the people visiting the page. What do you, could, are you prepared to share what's potentially the most spammiest thing you ever did back then? I have shared this one before, but reverse cloaking. Okay. And this still makes me chuckle to that. <laughs> Altavista were, as I say, very adversarial. There were things that would automatically get you banned. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned web position gold. Yeah. Produced doorway pages and could, you know, automate to an extent those. There was a little GIF that it included in those for tracking purposes. And AltaVista, if it saw that GIF, that file name for that GIF on a page, ban. Um, there were other things, you know, white text on white background had started to be detected people would still do it other ways you'd put a white background image and white text um you'd, you'd use javascript to change the background there were, there were other ways around it but we had a load of people like i say copying our page for mm -hmm. this top dating company i was working with and it was becoming annoying every week i'm having to file spam requests and, and, you know, copyright requests for hundreds of these pages. So what I did was I started cloaking our site. But the engines got the clean version. It was the users who got the version with white on white text, the spammy images, everything I knew could be auto detected and banned went into the visible page served to users and never served to engines. And I even emailed AltaVista and told them what I'd done. They never replied, <laughs> but I like to think that they chuckled as much as I did. And we had no more problems. We never saw another person copying our page because they automatically got themselves banned the second they did it. That's absolutely genius. So the, the, like, the clean, as you say, the clean experience, the good experience, was that actually still ranking well then? Yeah. So that's quite interesting then. So does that lead you to believe that maybe some of the stuff when you were actually spamming, maybe you should have all just done really good, clean? I very stuff rarely anyway. had to rely on spamming. However, some of it is in the way you implement it. You know, look at how many things that spammers do are based on good practices, just without the understanding of what makes them good and done to death. You know, using the words that the user uses is actually really good for conversions. Overusing the words that, that the people use 
isn't. It, it's a bad experience. It almost looks like you're patronizing people. Uh, it reads badly. That's spamming. If you're a good writer, you can still get all the usage of a word you want into a page. And it will read naturally. Mm -hmm. If you're a bad writer, you can't. Mm -hmm. I always liked um, Barry Lloyd, make me top. His quote, I'm a spammer, but I'm an elegant spammer because conversions matter more than rankings. I can buy traffic. If the conversions are good, I don't need the engines. I can buy traffic mm -hmm. and the engines are just freebies. So yeah. I definitely wouldn't ever sacrifice conversion for ranking. So did you, I mean, did you used to see a lot of negative SEO back then? You know, people yes. attacking each other. Yes. Um, and various forms. I mean, the one nobody would call negative, but it happens all the time. Your biggest risk of getting caught as an SEO when you're using questionable tactics is your rivals. If they see it, they will report it. Um, if they're not smart on SEO, why the hell did you need tricks and, and that to beat them anyway? They're probably as smart as you. They will probably spot what you've done. If what you've done can be reported, expect it to get reported. You just gave them an easy win. So always make sure that it looks legit. What kind of negative SEO stuff did you used to see back then? Now, that's one of the reasons that we didn't share stuff. There were, and still are, things you can do that harm people. There are still things to die that can be used to harm people that I will not share because they still work. And the less people who know about it, the less damage will be done. There are some who sometimes put these things out and say, well, that will force the search engines to fix it. Some of these things are very, very difficult to fix. There will be fallout. Either they won't fix it all and, you know, businesses will be hurt, people will be put out of business, people will go hungry, or the search engines will be oversensitive, sites will be shut down, people will be hurt, businesses will, yeah. It's it is it's 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 a delicate balance, and I think I think I think obviously I, even Google they would be the first to say it's quite obvious that they are managing a real balance. They're not one hundred percent honest themselves, but I think a lot of that the basis for that is purely down to just trying to preserve the good of what Google is more than you know just so that it won't be completely trashed by manipulation. Um, I think most of the time they. They give you the truth, but sometimes it's a nuanced truth. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that's simply because we have different definitions from for things than they do. Mm. And we have different perspectives on things mm. that, that they do. Um, let me just give you a very, very quick example of that. A lot of people think that a lot of things are ranking factors because they imagine that the SERP is the product. Mm. And it really isn't. What Google are making is the algorithm that will generate any SERP on demand. Mm. So the idea of um, click data being applied to a site for a specific search, that's useless. It doesn't scale. Google don't want that. What they want to do is change the algorithm that will then work across all searches now, today, tomorrow, next year. It's always about changing the algorithm. The algorithm is what they are optimizing, never the SERP. And a lot of people misunderstand that difference. Mm. They will not change the ranking of a site based on interaction. They will change the algorithm and what signals they're using in the first place, what signals make the best results across the board now and in future for this. What was the first conference that ever happened? Was it actually PubCon? No. Okay, Search so what engine was the... strategies was going before PubCom. Right. And it was um, that in America? PubCom was built on the success of uh, Search Engine Strategies. Search Engine Strategies was already touring all over the world. Oh, okay. Who uh, was running that? It was run you know? by, Dave, by Danny Sullivan. Oh, right. 
uh, and there were several core speakers who toured with it, plus local speakers, um, various sponsors, and, and so Mike Grahan was at pretty much all of them. Right, as a speaker. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he was a good one. He was one of the people I watched present early on to determine who I wanted to be as a speaker when it was it was my turn to present. Mm -hmm. I always say that you you get a lot out of your first few conferences from watching the presentations, looking at what works, what doesn't for you, what would fit your style and what wouldn't, and who you want to be when presenting. And that won't only help you if you ever want to present at a big event, but it will help your sales pitches too. Mm -hmm. Look at what was convincing and really got the, the complex information across quickly and that's going to help you in every sales pitch yeah um so yeah mike um barry lloyd who i mentioned mm -hmm. fantastic raconteur he was another inspiration so i i watched those guys present i went my own way definitely and I didn't like doing the presentations. So much of my work was under wraps at the time that I couldn't really talk about most of the projects I was working on. Always anywhere from 25% to 30 something percent of my clients are other SEOs or SEO agencies. You know, I provide advice, a second opinion, guidance, um i can't talk about what i'm doing for them yeah because obviously you know the clients go directly to them and quite rightly so i i, yeah. I don't want to be stealing those clients i don't want those, those clients coming to me i like the fact that the agency gets all the headaches and i just get the really cool stuff to play with <laughs> um so there was a lot of stuff i couldn't talk about so i tended to go into the review sessions mm -hmm. So people would bring their sites and you would quickly do it and in real time show them some of the things that they were missing, some of the things that would work and give them some of the advice. So I, I was doing live consultation then. Of course, we all remember Ammonize. <laughs> <laughs> so the first PubCon. He was coming to London. Which, so which one, Barry Lloyd? Mike, Mike no, Mackin. Mike, Mike Mackin, yeah. A lot of us wanted to, to meet up and a few people were, oh, I can't, it's a weekday. Boss will never let me off. And the guys at Webmaster World, being creative SEO type, said, pretend it's a conference. <laughs> Call it PubCon. And somebody generated a page for it <laughs> that talked about PubCon and they, they could tell the boss that they wanted to attend the conference, PubCon, they're bound to bring away top tips. And honestly, you were. You were talking with some of the best SEOs around. It was a, it was a lot of fun. I, I was, I was so at that first one. The name PubCon actually literally means conference in a pub. Yeah. And so what year was that, the very first PubCon? Can you that remember? was 2001. 2001, okay. And there were no talks. It was all interacting people in the <laughs> pub. Oh, there were a lot of tips. A lot of tips. But... It, it was bring something of your own to share and they'll share something good back, well, add, add stuff yeah. to trade. Everybody knows that when you go to a conference, the value that you get is not from the talks. It is from the discussions in the pub afterwards. That yes. is where you get the value. And exactly. that's where we people will exchange. A whole day of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it likes Brighton. Well, yes, my favourite. And that's what I was just going to ask you. So the very first Brighton, I believe, were you that, uh, that the... Uh, in a room I, wasn't, above a pub? I don't think at the very first one, no. Oh, right. But I, I went to some of the very early ones when it was still a group of people meeting in the back room or upstairs of a pub uh, and doing a pub quiz. <laughs> um, it was very small. Just to jump back actually to PubCon and what was interesting because we were talking about you know the sharing the snippets, the shared discussions. Can you remember from can you remember anything that was shared with you? You don't obviously have to reveal names, but is there anything yes. you can remember? Yeah? Yes. 
Would you share that with no. the group? <laughs> <laughs> what were the actual themes you were talking about? Oh, again, I was dealing with stuff on a scale. Just about six months before PubCon won, there had been this, this quite big thread in Webmaster World about whether you could get more than a thousand pages indexed. And a lot of people were only sort of a hundred thousand. People were still tending to do very static kind of optimization, whereas I was dealing with dynamic. And this was something I'd bought across from the adult industry because of the scale. You mm -hmm. couldn't deal with something the size of the adult industry by building doorway pages mm -hmm. for you know 280 countries that were running real-time searches in in you know 24 hours the so stuff pretty. we all take for granted in the days of wordpress but back then there was no wordpress there were very few sites that were dynamic most sites were built in flat html and they built their doorway pages and their, all of their tactics around flat HTML. And the minute they got a big client who had a database driven site, they tried to create 10 doorway pages for them. And that lasted into the mid noughties. Um, I was consulting with the second biggest online mobile phone retailer. And they put out a request for proposal and all the tenders that came back had keyword research for a couple of thousand and they were basically going to generate 10 to 20 doorway pages and i'm kind of like what decade are we in <laughs> but what do you what do you really I prefer miss? things now do you that's interesting i, so I, I was going to ask love you love fresh challenges i love the fact that what I love about this career is every single day, I mm. get to do more than I've ever done before. Because I even get to pull on the experiences of yesterday. But what do you, what do you miss about those early days in SEO? It was easy, easy, easy to do affiliate money. And yeah. you could make big, big money. But it's much easier to get client money these days. Uh, affiliate has become harder, a client has become mm. much easier. When I started, most companies would not talk to you about SEO. They thought we were hacking the engines. They thought we must be hacking the SERP. Mm -hmm. You would have to sign an NDA to even talk to them. Mm. Um, I definitely had to sign a lot of NDAs over the years. Mm. The exclusions were the companies that were too small, so the little mom and pop businesses, mm. and of course, porn pills and pharma, who are used to operating in the grey areas and didn't find it. I don't think they worried if we were hacking as long as it worked. Um, so they didn't worry about the NDAs except to protect any propriety information they were going to give you. Mm. Would you, but would everyone you... else, you you signed an NDA. When I talked with CNN before taking them on, you know, there was a lot of, of gentle reassurance going on that you know there's there's going to be no no sharing of their secrets. Would you go back to those days if you could, or do you prefer today? Well, I personally would because I was younger then and I I could. I could quite go for being 30 again. Almost. I just meant on an SEO basis. Obviously, I think we all are. Personally, I think we don't like to uh, be 20 somethings again running around. I don't know. There's a lot of people who are 20 something now who may be watching this. And, you know, they definitely don't even want to be five years younger. They're, they're so relieved to be finally out of teenage. <laughs> don't you remember when we were there? Well, I've got to say, actually, I don't think the where, where I am now, which I'm. Um, 48 nearly 49 i think um i wouldn't trade the what i've learned and the wisdom and knowledge i have i wouldn't trade that for anything do you miss that kind of feeling that underground almost feeling a bit renegade early days you know the forums and 
there's a little bit of that. I miss the forum days where it was much more community minded. There were there were lots of people who didn't take part in the forums and kept their heads down. You know, for every single person that would register a forum, there were a hundred viewers. For every single person that commented, there were a hundred who had registered. Uh, and those those really were the kind of percentages. So the, the number of people who were talking were a minority. Mm. And it gives you this sense of a smaller community than there really is. And there's a mm. lot of people um, sitting in the shadows, siphoning up and, and using it without giving anything back. And that's always been there. You couldn't see them. Mm. I didn't like the drive towards blogs. And it's why you'll still find me helping out in groups more than blogging on my own stuff. It, it's a principle. And why do you not like blogs? I don't like walled gardens. If you're going to share, share. If you're insisting that you have to benefit from it, it has to be on your terms, on your territory, you're not sharing, you're manipulating. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it depends how it goes. And just for me personally, it was a principle. I share openly. But isn't I share when sharing. you can see that the only thing I get out of it is the, is the sense of me that people take away. But isn't a blog sharing? Compared to forums, no. <laughs> No, it really isn't. If you, if you ask anyone who was around in the forum days how those discussions went, and yeah, sometimes they were heated, but the depth was in the discussion. Once it's on somebody's blog, you're far less likely to comment because if you disagree with them, they delete your comment. Actually, that's quite interesting because one thing I've noticed about you, Aman, is you do contribute massively. Um, online particularly in Facebook groups and it's really interesting that you've said that so now I can make that direct connection and now that I can see that for you using these Facebook groups is actually a way it's almost like tapping back into those forums and I can see that's how you're approaching it and I've always wondered why you give so much time so much value and so much input into those comments in Facebook, which you know can just be deleted any minute, they can it can just be gone. I was always wondered why, and now and now I get that sense that I guess for you that you are actually tapping back in to it's I guess it is nostalgic. You're tapping back into the atmosphere of the forums. G plus did exactly that. I had a, a huge amount of content on G plus that 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 went. It's gone mm. now. Some people say, well, that was a huge amount of valuable stuff and you didn't, you know, salvage it and pull it out somewhere. No, I didn't. If you weren't following me at the time, you missed it. Mm. And if you held back because you thought, oh, I can catch this somewhere else later, you can't always. Um, the people that I interacted with on G+, there's so many of them that I'm still in contact with. Mm. Um, Mark Trabargan, that's where I first met him. And he will tell you the value of some of the exchanges and discussions we had. Uh, Eric Engie, G Plus brought us more into each other's orbits and we collaborated on a few things and had a few discussions. Again, what we took away from that, the relationship and the community sense is always still there. Mm. The connections you make are based on the moment and nothing deletes that. So as a final, just to wrap up, because I think we're gonna end here, but if I was to ask you your one thing, so if you look back on those early days, what is your one favorite thing about it? Is it, is it the forums? Your fondest? The community, the sharing. The community. Because Trust me, this industry has come a huge, huge way. Mm. Like I say, there was no SEO industry. There was web promotion of various types. And all the money back then was in advertising. People wanted mm -hmm. to sell you ads. Mm. 
So we were the ones fighting against that, looking at other ways of making money that were more open and more inclusive and didn't create ad giants. We were always looking to support the underdogs and support each other. And it's the ones who were sharing their SEO secrets and their views and helping small businesses come up that formed the internet we all take for granted today. The internet that doesn't require you to pay ridiculous phone calls that, that we had in those early days. You mm. know, the free internet is based on the fact that there's a lot of money in it mm. and they would rather get you on there freely mm. um, than, than miss out on all that mm. phone-driven business that the internet generates. The huge variety of projects and sites came because so many of us shared how to make little tiny seed projects grow, mm -hmm. how to build communities online, how to make uh, a, a bootstrap operation successful. Mm -hmm. That was a gift. And mm. you can name a lot, of those, a lot of those early pioneers as people that built the infrastructure that everything we've got today was based on. And you know what? I think that is actually the perfect point to end. Um, I'm on. It's been, for, as always, it's been fantastic to listen to your wisdom, knowledge and experience. And thank you very much for your input and being our very first pioneer. You're very welcome. Um, really enjoyed it. It, it it's nice to look back but it's particularly nice to look back into how it got us to where we are yeah and where it can take us in future yeah okay thank you very much Amon, and i shall say goodbye now <laughs>